So this video is going to introduce a couple more uh, fundamentals about Java uh, that we didn't talk about in the last video. So we're going to talk about converting between primitive data types. We're going to talk about final variables. We're going to talk about the string class. We're going to talk about scope. We're going to talk a little bit more about comments as well as programming style and how to actually read input from the keyboard. So the first thing we'll talk about is converting between primitive data types. So conversion between primitives automatically happens in Java, but Java will not perform any conversion automatically that may result in the loss of data. So for example, I have x being declared to store an integer value. I have y being declared to store a double value, and then I assign the value 2.5 to y, right? So y now contains 2.5. If I say x is assigned 2.5, that's gonna result in data loss, right? Because 2.5 is gonna lose data, right? That is a double value or a double literal being shoved inside of an integer. It's going to have to cut some of that double off. That's not going to work um, in Java automatically. The reason for that is Java is what we call a strongly typed language. And what that means is before a value is assigned to a variable, the data types of the variable itself and the value being assigned are checked to determine if they're compatible, right? So before this 2.5 is thrown into Y in memory, Java's gonna check, okay, Y is a double, 2.5 is a double, these are okay. Now when I try to throw 2.5 into X, Java's gonna check, X is an integer, 2.5 is a double, this is not gonna work out because I'm gonna lose I'm going to lose data here. And we have a concept called widening and narrowing conversions. Um, and this is not anything critical for your, your salvation or anything, but just to kind of introduce you to it. Uh, primitive data types are ranked. And what the ranking is, is basically a data type will outrank another data type if it can hold a larger number. Right, so a float, for example, would outrank an integer because floats can store larger values than ints can. An int would outrank a byte, right, because ints can store larger values than bytes. So our two types of conversions is if we try to store a value of a lower ranked data type into a variable of a higher ranked data type, that's fine, Java will do that for us. So for example, if I say I have, let's say I have double um, value. Let's say I try to assign the value one to this double, right? One, we could say is a byte um, because it's a very small value. Double is a very large value. So I'm storing a literal of a smaller or a lower ranked data type than the variable itself, that's fine. Now if I try to say byte value, and maybe my number is something crazy like this, right? This is a very large double here being shoved inside of a lower ranked data type or a byte. That's not going to work, right? So we call the automatic conversion, right? Storing a byte inside of a double variable will work because that is a widening conversion. Storing a double inside of a byte, however, will not work. That's called a narrowing conversion. You could lose data there. Now we can do something called casting by using a casting operator, which lets us kind of force that conversion to take place if we really want to force it to happen. And all we do to do that is put the data type in parentheses right before our literal value. 
You may use this often, you may never use this, but it does exist. So let's say I wanted to do, let's say I wanna to try to store this huge value inside this byte. I could do a cast here, and I'm definitely gonna lose some, some data here. Let's print this out and see what we lose. But I'm forcing Java to convert this double down to a byte, because we're going to a much lower ranked data type. I'm forcing it to convert that and then store that conversion inside value. So you'll see I have 21 here. So somehow Java converting this large value of a double down into a byte, it's now 21. Right, that's much smaller, it's a completely different number. We've lost a lot of data here, but we can force it to happen by using this casting operator. Moving on to creating constants, uh, we can declare a variable as something called a constant variable. And basically what a constant variable does is it says, I'm gonna declare the variable I'm gonna give that variable a value, and no matter what, during my program, that value is not going to change, right? So that would be like a, a variable that you use throughout your whole program that you know you're never gonna change the value of. You may want to consider making that a constant variable. And we, we do that by using the final keyword before our data type. And best practice, like it says here, is to write the variable name in all uppercase, and because we're doing all uppercase, we can't do camel case, right? We can't do uh, the second and third words or whatever being capitalized since everything is all uppercase. So we put underscores in between our words with constants. So let's say, for example, I have a, I don't know, price of something that I know is not going to change. I'll just name it price constant, something like that. Let's say that the price is always going to be $4.99 no matter what, right? No matter what happens in my program, I cannot change price constant's value. If I hover over it, it'll say you can't assign a value to a constant variable, right? Because I've used this final keyword. So that's kind of what a constant variable is, and that's how you create one. Obviously, pretty situational, depending on the use, but um, it is something that can be useful. Now let's talk about strings and kind of review what a string is. So we said that a string is just a sequence of characters, um, and we use strings to represent any data that contains text. So that's things like names, addresses, messages to the user, anything like that. String literals are enclosed in double quotation marks, if you remember. So, hello world being enclosed in double quotation marks tells Java that this is a string literal. So is a string a primitive data type, right? We said primitive data types can store only one value at a time they don't have attributes, and they don't have methods, right? So is a string a primitive data type? Well, string is not a primitive data type in Java. Uh, Java programs have strings all the time. Strings are very important. Um, we do operations on strings. We use them all the time, but they are not a primitive data type. The Java API, which was, again, that library of Java classes, gives us a class to handle strings called the string class. Now we can use that string class to create string objects that can store the strings and perform operations on them. And you may have noticed, if you're kind of eagle-eyed here, all my primitive data types have a lowercase. They're all lowercase, right? These are some examples of primitives, right? If I want to make a string, string has an uppercase letter, right? 
And in Java, a class always has an uppercase letter. So you can tell that we're using the string class here. We're using the string class here. It's not a primitive data type. So what does that make string? If it's not a primitive variable, what does that make it? Well, let's take a look. So we learned in the last video, objects just are just entities of software that have attributes and they have methods. And if you remember, attributes are just data values that are stored in the object, and methods are procedures that perform operations on those attributes. So, for example, we said student may have a GPA. They might, as an attribute, they may have a method called check GPA that would, I don't know, retrieve that GPA value, right? We've seen classes used as containers for our applications, right? Uh, if we go look here, simple right here is a container that just kind of holds my application in it. That's kind of how we're going to use classes in this course. Um, you can write your own class, which you'll do in CSCI 1260, where you create your own um, classes like the string class, like the math class, the system class. Uh, you'll learn about how to do that. And in those classes you create, you'll create their attributes, you'll create their methods. Um, in this class, we're really focused on actually using classes that already exist in the Java API. But for now, just think of a class as like a blueprint that objects are created from. The class is not an object, but kind of a description of an object. So, Back to strings, then if they're not primitive data types, if they're not primitive variables, that makes them object variables, right? A string is an object, not a variable. It is an object of the string class. So the Java API gives us a class for handling strings, and it's named the string class. Again, notice the capital S. In Java, classes always have a capital S first letter. So the first step in using this class is you want to declare a variable of the string class data type, which I showed here, right? I'm declaring a variable. I'm giving it a name of first name. So my variable is called first name. Its data type is string, right? Capital S. And that's how you use a string object. So it works a lot like a primitive, um, but strings are not primitive variables. Now here's where it gets kind of confusing for a lot of people is, okay, great, string is an object, who cares, right? Um, objects work very different in memory than primitive variables do, okay? So I'm gonna to try to use my, my drawing skills here. Here's a little picture of my RAM, right? And let's just think about our RAM as being partitioned into little sections that are a certain amount of storage, right? They're a certain size. Primitive variables will actually store the literal itself, so Balance is the name of my variable. And let's just say balance is balance points to, I don't know, this location in my memory, right? Balance is assigned a value of 95.67. Right, so that actual value is stored in memory, the value itself, right? So that makes sense, right? Primitive data types can only store one variable at a time. If I changed this to just 5.67, because it can only store one thing at a time, now it would store 5.67, right? That's how primitives work. They store the actual value 
that they've been assigned. Well, we just said that strings are objects, not primitives. So how does that differ from a primitive variable? Well, rather than the string variable holding the literal string, right? Um, and this should be double quotes. This should be double quotes. Rather than first name storing the word John, right? Because string is a class type variable or an object, it's going to store the address of a string object. So here's a picture of my memory. Here is first name. I'm gonna abbreviate it. Here's first name. Rather than first name storing John, right, which it does not, first name is gonna store a memory location somewhere else on my, on my memory. Right, it could be like way on the other side of my my RAM, way over here, that has the word John. It's gonna have an address, right? A memory address. So that's the main difference between ver uh, primitives and objects. Is primitives store the actual value in memory? Objects store an address to some string object somewhere else in memory, right? We also call that a reference. So first name is what we call a reference variable because it's storing a reference to some string object that has a value of John, right? So the takeaway of that with this example, right? First name is a string class variable that rather than holding the actual value John, instead it holds the memory address of a string object. And we talked about objects having things called attributes, attributes and methods, right? So if you want to think about our object as like a like a little table, right? This is a string object. It's going to have attributes and it's going to have methods. So one of those attributes might be something called like value, right? And that value in our example would be John. First name is going to store an address that points to this string object, which has an attribute containing the word John. Very confusing topic, uh, but that is the kind of key difference between primitives and object type variables. Primitives store the literal value, objects store a reference to, class type variables store a reference to an object. Moving on from the confusing stuff to stuff we can actually use. Um, strings have some methods that we have access to that can be useful when we're working with strings. Um, this is a few of the most used methods of a string class. If you take CSCI 1260, you'll do a lot more um, of the string class methods in that course. Um, and I'll do some code examples um, I don't know if I'll do videos of those or if I'll just upload those, but I will do some code examples that have these methods in them. Um, care at will give you the character at the specified index position. We'll talk about this one later. Length is probably the one you'll use the most. Length and these conversion ones here. So length just tells you how long your string is. So if I have my name here, Will, if I can't count for some reason and I want to say, well, how long is Will? I can say, let's call this name length.
I can say, okay, well, name length is going to be assigned first name dot length, right? Because first name references a string object, I can use that string object's methods whenever I want. So I can say first name dot length. Okay. And then I could print that out. So system dot out dot print name length. And we see that it's four. To lowercase, we'll just convert all of the letters in the string to lowercase. To uppercase, we'll, we'll convert all the characters in the string to uppercase. So if I wanted to display first name, but all, all uppercase, I could just say first name dot to uppercase. And you'll notice that I have parentheses here. That lets us know that we're working with a method, right? Uh, we said that system.out.print is a method here. It has parentheses, but there's stuff inside of those parentheses, right? The stuff inside the parentheses we said was our argument that we want to be displayed. Well, length has parentheses, but length doesn't require an argument. We still have to have the parentheses because it's a method but there is nothing we really want here as an argument, so we'll just leave the parentheses empty. Same thing with two uppercase. And we see that it converted my, my name to all uppercase letters. So let's talk about index positions. Um, index positions are something that you'll use all the time in programming. In this class and all the programming classes you'll take after this one, um, all an index position refers to is just like a location. And we're going to specifically be talking about index positions with strings. So with a string, an index position just refers to the location of a character inside of that string. So in Java and most programming languages, we begin our index positions at zero instead of one. So that's what trips the most people up. Um, so the very first index position in a string is zero, right? So in the word cheddar here, C, my first letter has an index position of zero because we start at zero. The third letter in the word cheddar would be index position two, or the letter E, right? That can be kind of odd, but if you always just remember we start with zero with our indexes, um, it's easy to find stuff. Let's talk about scope and local variables. Um, and this, this probably won't come back up until a little later in the semester, but I do want to introduce it. Every variable has something called scope, and all that refers to is which parts of my program can access this variable, right? Another way of thinking about that is a variable is only going to be visible to statements that are inside that variable's scope. So, so far I've really shown variables that are declared inside the main method here, right? If I tried to access price constant outside of its scope, like let's say I tried to do it like way down here, right? This is outside the scope, right? Because the scope of price constant is the method in which it was declared. And we'll revisit scope later, but for now just remember that scope is the part of the program that has access to the variable. Any, any variable we declare inside a method is called a local variable. So all the variables we use this semester will be local variables because we're declaring them inside of a method.
Some more stuff about local variables. The scope of a local variable begins when we declare it, and it ends when the method ends, right? So all of our variables inside my main method, their scope begins when I declare them, and it ends when the main method ends, which is down here on line 20. You cannot access local variables outside of their method or inside the method, but before you declare them. So for example, I declare name length. Let's see, I, I declare first name here on line 17. If I try to print first name before I declare it, it's not gonna work, right? Because it, it's outside of the scope. Java doesn't know what first name is because it hasn't been declared yet. Again, going back to that sequential ordering of things. Local variables must be unique. You have to have them named something unique. You cannot have two local variables with the same name in the same scope. So for example, I have a main method here. I declare a variable named number that's gonna store an int. I declare a variable named number that's gonna store an int. Because they're named the same thing and they're inside the same scope, that's gonna give me an error, it's not gonna work. So you do need to name your variables something unique whenever you wanna declare them. Moving on to comments, remember that comments are just short notes placed by the programmer in the code. And they're really designed to explain how different parts of the program work. Um, if there's something that may be confusing to someone that is not you, or even if it is you, if you wrote something and you think you may wanna remember what it did, just leave a comment explaining what it's doing. The compiler ignores comments. We have three main types of comments in Java. We've got single line comments, multi-line comments, and documentation comments. A single line comment is the one that we've seen, right? The two forward slashes, and then whatever we want the comment to say. That's just on one line, right? Uh, the compiler will ignore everything from the slashes to the end of the line, like we said before. We can put these wherever we want in our program. You can see I've got it here above my method uh, header. You can see I've got it here after my statement, right? We can put them really wherever we want probably not in between, like we would probably wouldn't want to put it right here in between double and pay rate, that would just look bad. Um, but we can use those pretty often. Multi-line comments are for like larger things that you want to explain. If it may take more than a single line, uh, we use a different punctuation mark for those. It's not two forward slashes anymore. It's a forward slash and an asterisk to start the multi-line comment, and then an asterisk and a forward slash to end the multi-line comment. So everything between these two symbols is gonna be ignored by the compiler. So here's an example here. All the text in green is my comment, and you can see that they're in between these markers. That's an example of a multi-line comment. A documentation comment is something like you saw in lab three that I threw in. Um, these just begin with a forward slash followed by two asterisks instead of one and end with a single asterisk followed by a forward slash. And the reason we do documentation comments, there's a program called javadoc that can extract all of your documentation comments from your program um, and generate some good looking stuff for you. So. We're gonna use these in our, um, in our programs over the course of the semester, and I'll upload a document to D2L that, that has this in there, these different types of comments. So um, you can access that if you forget. Sometimes we use block comments if we wanna just visually separate a comment from the surrounding code. There's all kinds of ways to do block comments. Um, Here's just some examples. This is totally fine if you wanna do this. It only improves your code visibility. So an example of a block comment, you know, might be something like, um, uh, 
you know, something like that. However you want to do it. Um, they're just designed to kind of separate your comments from your code. Let me call that a block comment. Programming style is something that is important but weirdly enough, it's not required for your compiler to actually work, um, your program to work. Programming style really is just talking about, is your code visually organized, right? How do you use spacing, indentation, blank lines, comments, comment blocks, all that stuff to visually arrange your source code? Um, Programming style, like it says, is not associated with syntax and it's ignored by the compiler. So technically, you could type every single thing in your entire Java program on one line of code, as long as you had all the symbols in place that you need, and it would compile and run. Now obviously if you had this all of this stuff on one line of code, that would look really bad and hard to read. So I'm using some, some programming style here. I'm separating this stuff out. I'm using comments, um, all this stuff to make my code more visually appealing. I can read it easier. It's easier to read. That's what we call programming style. Um, and that's something that kind of comes with time is developing good programming style. IntelliJ helps you do that. It will put in the, the braces for you. Um, it can be pretty helpful with some programming style stuff. But making your code look clean and very organized is just something that comes with practice. So here's an example of a program that I wrote that's all on one line, right? And it was too long for me to even fit in a screenshot, so I had to turn on text wrap. But you can see it's all on line one, because line two is blank, right? This is a fully functional program, a Java program. The compiler understands it. It will execute this program, no issues at all. Obviously, that's pretty difficult to read and figure out what's going on. Now, imagine if this was a very complex program, it would be even harder to read, right? So what programming style lets us do, this is the same program, just using better programming style. We see that I have my class braces. Everything inside my class I've indented over with the tab key. Everything inside my method I've indented over again with the tab key, again, just to kind of separate all this stuff and make it easier to read. Uh, it says here you may receive point deductions on assignments if you don't use proper programming style. Um, I'm not going to be too too strict on that, but you know if your programming style is just terrible, I may tell you to try to improve that because that is something that's important uh, to becoming a good programmer. Readability is very important because a lot of times you know you're going to be working on something with someone else or multiple people. You want to be able to read what each other is doing as easily as possible. All right, so the last thing that I'm gonna cover is how we can actually read input from the keyboard um, and use that in our programs, right? So we can ask the user, hey, what's your name? The user can type it in the keyboard and we can actually take what they've typed and do something with it. Um, so we learned about the system.out object, which was output, right? System.output, we can display output to the screen by using the terminal or the console, right? We have another system object we can use called system.in or system.input. Uh, the standard input device is typically the keyboard, right? And the system.in object, we can use that to read keystrokes. So what happens when the system.in object reads input is it takes those in as byte values, which are obviously kind of unusable to us as human beings. So we need to take those byte values and make them usable. 
And how we do that is we make use of another Java API class called the scanner class. So what the scanner class does is it's going to scan those byte values and we can actually turn those into something we can work with. So in order for us to use the scanner and the system.in objects, we need to do two things. First thing we need to do is to create a scanner object. And we do that by just saying scanner. We give the scanner a name. Whenever we create an object, and string is a special case, right? So string is, because we've said that string is an object. String is so commonly used that we don't have to do this with string. Uh, but any other object we create, when we declare it, we need to say it is a new object of whatever class we're using, right? So we're using the scanner class. So I say keyboard is a scanner object. I'm going to assign it the location, right? Because we said with objects, they have memory locations, not values. I'm assigning it the memory location of a brand new scanner object. That's kind of what this is saying. Now, my argument here in my parentheses for my new scanner object, what am I scanning, right? Well, I'm scanning the system input device or the keyboard. And if that's confusing, just remember that anytime we create a scanner, it will look just like this. Okay, kind of like the main method. It's just, it is how it is. This is how the scanner creation looks. So we can kind of break down this statement. The first part of this statement declares a variable named keyboard, right? Keyboard's data type is scanner. We know that scanner is a class, so keyboard is a class type variable, right? Meaning keyboard is going to store the memory location of a scanner object. The second part of the statement assigns the address of a new scanner object to the keyboard variable. All right, that's kind of how that's working. So I'm going to actually do this in my program. All right, and that'll probably give me an error. Yeah, we'll come back to that. So I'm following along. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, to actually use the scanner class, right? this is not one that's included like the system class. Scanner is something that if we want to use it, we need to kind of tell Java, hey, I'm going to use the scanner class. So go ahead and bring that into my program. OK. And how we do that is we use an import statement. Okay, and the import statements go before everything else in our file. It even goes before the class name. And the import statement basically tells the compiler where to actually find the scanner class in the Java library. So think about the Java library like a literal library of books, right? I'm telling the compiler where to find the book that I want. Okay, compiler, import scanner, and you can find scanner in the Java library, in the util package, scanner.java. I'm giving it a path to scanner, right? And there, this, again, is something that kind of comes with time, is remembering which ones you need to import and which ones you don't. But if I look at IntelliJ, it's giving me an error. It's saying, I don't know what scanner is. Cannot resolve symbol scanner. Basically meaning, I don't know what you want me to do with that. So if I want to use the scanner, again, it goes before everything. So before the class name, import java.util dot scanner. And you can see my error went away, right? So what happens is, is we have different scanner methods depending on what we're reading from the user, right? So if we're asking the user for their age, we might want to use 
one of the scanner methods that gets numbers. If we're asking the user their name, maybe we want the scanner method for strings. If we're asking the user for their GPA, maybe we want the scanner method for doubles, right? It just depends on what we're reading from the user. So this example here is asking the user for an integer value, right? System.out.print. So I'm displaying a message to the user. Enter an integer value. So I'm telling the user, hey, type in a number, right? Then I say, okay, assign keyboard, which is my scanner, dot next int. So next int is my scanner method that reads integer values. And then we're going to throw whatever that integer they typed, I'm going to throw that into my number variable. Okay. And we have a list here of methods. And I'm going to put some code examples on D2L of all of the stuff we've talked about in these videos, because I know this is a, a ton of information. Um, this week is like the information overload week. So I'm going to upload a lot of code files and go over a lot of this in the lab. But here are some of my scanner methods, right? Next byte lets us read bytes. Next double lets us scan doubles. Float lets us scan floats, so on and so forth. Now notice the only one that's weirdly named is our string one, right? It doesn't say next string, it says next line. And we'll talk about the next line method here in a second. Um, well, let's just go back to my IntelliJ here. Let's say that I have int age system.out.println. So I'm, I'm printing something to the screen. Please enter your age. All right, so what this is going to do is it's going to give me a message here and my program is going to end. All right, because I haven't done anything with my scanner yet. As soon as I say age is assigned keyboard.nextInt, now it's going to wait for me to type something in, right? Because I'm actually using my scanner. So if I run this, we'll see that it's actually waiting for me to type something in before it terminates. I type in my age, my program ends because I don't really do anything with age, right? I just store something in that variable and then move on. Now if I wanted to like print the age out, for example, We'll see that it's asking me for my age. I'll put that in. We'll see that it did store what I typed in and displayed it to me. So that's kind of how the scanner works. We talked about the import statement. And, you know, memorizing java.util is just something that, that comes with time. Again, um, most of the stuff we're going to import in this class comes from java.util. So that's, that's handy to remember. Now, if we look at, let's go back here. Let's say that I want to let the user enter their name. Remember we said scanner did not have a next string method, right? We have next int, we have next double. We don't have a next string method. It was called next line, which is a little different. Um, oops. Next line is a little different, and we'll talk about where it gets a little weird here in a second. 
So what's my age? 25. It's going to ask me for my name, and I messed something up here. Let's see what I mess up. Oh. What did I mess up? All right, so this just goes to show you that this stuff can confuse everyone, even me. Um, we have something called the keyboard buffer, and I'm going to talk about that first, and then I'll go back to reading characters. The way that your your keyboard interfaces with your program with your memory, with your RAM, with all of that stuff, is it's line by line. So when I say keyboard.nextint, right, all I'm saying to my, my memory is grab the next integer from the line of text, right? And if you want to think about it like, we have lines here, right, in our keyboard buffer. Let's say that I have 25 on my first line. And let's say that I have, you know, a string called will on the keyboard buffer. I have 34 on there. I have all kinds of stuff. What keyboard.nextint does is it says, hey memory, give me the next integer in the keyboard buffer. It'll pull that 25 out. Right? And what gets a little tricky with that is when you use the new line method, next line, sorry to read in strings. So what happens when I use a scanner method call, and this is very confusing, um, is whenever I use a scanner method call, a new line character is stored in the keyboard buffer. Every time I use a scanner class method call, so when I say keyboard.nextint, it's going to read the next integer, and it's going to store a new line character in my keyboard buffer, right? If I say keyboard.nextline to read a string, it's going to pick up that new line character, okay? It's not going to pick up the actual string, it's going to pick up that new line character and it's just going to skip right past letting the user type. And this is really hard to explain without actually, you know, uploading the code example. And I will show the code example on D2L and in the lab. Basically, the takeaway here, if you use the next line method after any of the other methods, you need to consume that new line character. You need to get rid of it. Okay, so what that looks like is this. Practically what that looks like is this. Here we'll see that I have next line as my first scanner method that I'm using. Then I have next int as the second scanner method that I'm using. So this will work properly. If I run this, it'll ask me to enter my name and then my age. And then it'll give me my message, you know, like I want. Now, like I said in the slides, if you use next line after any of the other ones, which here I'm using next line after next int, it's going to put that new line character in my keyboard buffer, and it's not even going to let me type my name. So this just won't work. It's going to ask me for my age. We'll see that it didn't even let me type my name in because it it ate that new line character instead of the keyboard input, right? 
hello blank, you are 25 years old, right? So this does not work. If you do wanna use next line after another keyboard method, like it says here, you need to consume that new line. All you have to do to do that, it's pretty simple to do. All you have to do is just say keyboard.nextLine. That will eat up that new line character and you can go on to letting the user type again. So enter your age. Now we'll see it's letting me type my name and it's gonna display my message. Check out the code examples that I post for a, a more detailed uh, example of that. but. That's kind of how the keyboard buffer works. Something you can do to always avoid that from happening is just do next line first and then everything else after. And that does it for this video. I will upload those code examples um, and you can take a look at it. And we will discuss some more of this in the lab this week.